Good afternoon, everyone. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Welcome to the launching of Peter Bungard's Southeast Asia Collection and to a special lecture on Asian history. Thank you for participating in this event. I am Michelle Palumbari, Assistant Professor at the Asian Center, and I will be your host and moderator for today. It is a privilege for all of us to have with us great scholars and giants of Southeast Asia studies today. Surely you have been waiting for this event. So without much further ado, to officially open this event, let us all welcome the Dean of the Asian Center, Dr. Jofe B. Santarita. Thank you very much, Dr. Palumbarit, Chancellor Tan, Dr. Reyes, Dr. Henley, Asian Center colleagues, especially our library personnel headed by Ms. Tax Landa, friends and beloved participants, magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Three days from now, the Asian Center will officially turn 65. Established as Institute of Asian Studies in 1955, the Asian Center has evolved not only as a graduate degree granting institution, but also is envisioned by our founders as a world center rather than Philippine Center for the Study of Asia. In 1968, the Institute received a new mandate from the people of the Philippines expressed in Republic Act 5334 to develop a closer and broader contact with our Asian neighbors in the field of scholarship to attain profound studies on Asian cultures, history, social forces, and aspirations. At present, the Asian Center now operates on the general objective, which is to bring the reality of Asia to the Philippines, and the Philippines to the rest of Asia. This afternoon activity is another fulfillment of such objective. This webinar is all about knowledge, knowledge donating, knowledge sharing, and knowledge producing. First is knowledge donation. The 2000 books and archival materials collected by Dr. Peter Bongard in his uh, lifetime as researcher and scholar were donated to the Asian Center particularly to the Asian Center Library. The materials in the collection focus on, uh, as mentioned, desperate subjects ranging from economic, social, cultural, environmental, agricultural, and scientific histories of Asia, particularly Indonesia. The archive data sources from 1600 to 1950, called out from Indonesia's National Archive, is largely statistical, compiled uh, from colonial government, censuses, including birth, uh, marriages, and death. Second is the knowledge sharing with the lectures of Dr. Henley and Dr. Lopez. Most importantly is the interesting lecture of Dr. Reyes on finding intimacy in, in Asian history. When it comes to intimacy, I usually associated it to Kama Sutra, not because of sex, but because of devotion. Kajuraho temples, erotic sculptures aside, are built in devotion to Shiva, Vishnu, Brahma, and other deities. Thus, I am looking forward to know more on intimacy from Dr. Reyes' lecture. Third is the knowledge producing or production, which I hope will be beneficial to students and scholars who are present right now listening to our discussion or attending to our discussion, and later from the Boomgard collection. All this knowledge donating, knowledge sharing, and knowledge producing are not possible without the generosity of Dr. Reyes and without the all-out support of Chancellor Michael Tan. When Dr. Lopez mentioned about the possible donation, my first question is the transfer costs from the Netherlands to the Philippines. I am thankful that Chancellor Tan gave his support and financed the transfer last, uh, transfer last March. So maraming salamat po, Chancy Mike. To all our attendees, thank you for celebrating with us and I hope that you will participate lucidly in this knowledge donating, knowledge sharing, and knowledge producing. I hope that in this process, you will remember the works of Dr. Peter Boomgard and his contribution to Southeast Asian studies. Looking forward to celebrate and remember Dr. Boomgard's legacy in the next 35 years as we celebrate the centennial of the Asian Center in 2055. Magandang hapon po at welcome to the Asian Center, Dergayo, Changming, 
nagaiki, jai hind, mabuhay po tayong lahat. Maraming salamat po. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dean Santarita. And before we hear from Professor Tan, may I remind our participants, um, if you would like to ask questions, please leave your questions at the Q&A box here below. And now to give us um, an inspirational message, please welcome a distinguished scholar himself and famous press column Pinoy Kasi in the Philippine Daily Inquirer, former Chancellor of UP Diliman, and Professor Emeritus, please welcome Professor Michael Tan. Thank you, Mich thank you, Michelle. Uh, start off by greeting Dr. Rachel Reyes. Uh, I start from the ones who are further furthest away from the Philippines. No, and Dr. Henley, of course. We're most honored that uh, you are with us this afternoon, and that Dr. Reyes is going to be lecturing. And of course, uh, Dr. Jofi Santarita, the Dean of Asian Center, who has just uh, given the opening remarks. Rolly Talampas and other officials of Asian Center. And of course, a very special greeting to Dr. Ariel Lopez, who facilitated uh, the donation. He was the first one to inform us that Dr. Rachel Reyes wanted to donate the books. No? And of course, Dr. Ariel Lopez has, is carving out a name no, as uh, an authority on Indonesian studies, at least for the, from the viewpoint of, of the Philippines. No? I was struck by uh, Dr. Santarita's mentioning that Asian Center will be 65 years old. I was not aware that the 65th uh, birthday was coming up. No? And the Philippines, 65 is a very special age, as some of you know. That is the age of retirement for government officials. And it often means, too, that you are... Retiring is not necessarily seen as, as disappearing to the woodwork, you know, 65 years. The, for many people in the academe, especially, to be 65 means that you're going to finally find time to do everything you could not do <laughs> before you were 65 because you were too busy teaching and all of that. No? Um, I am 68, no? and, uh, but I was chancellor until March, and I thought that I could start doing all the things I wanted to do. That was an illusion no? because I continue to teach, and I'm very happy about that. Um, but I am especially looking forward uh, to working more closely with Asian Center because as an anthropologist, uh, Asian studies has always been something that I've been very, very interested in, being ethnic Chinese myself, but also having been exposed to uh, the region. And I feel that it's most appropriate that we are officially receiving the donation today. The, you know, just listening to the description there that you have uh, materials from, from, is it as early as the 17th century? Yeah, from the archives. And uh, I know social scientists have a reputation of not liking numbers, uh, but I can tell you I love numbers and I know historians love numbers, so we're all looking forward to that. In fact, uh, Ariel, uh, Ariel knows that I, I texted him at one point during the lockdown say, have the books arrived? Have the books arrived? <laughs> and then he said, yes, it has arrived. And I rushed off to Asian Center only to be told, sir, lockdown, di ka pwedeng pumasok. So I have not seen the, the collections and I'm looking forward to doing that. No? Maybe appropriately, I will be uh, teaching research methods in Philippine studies next sem, no? which is under uh, Asian studies. I don't know if we will be giving access to the students to the library by that time, no? but this is all. I, I feel it's important that uh, it's important that you let me look at the collection <laughs> so I can tell our students what we have and maybe encourage those who are truly interested in uh, Indonesian studies to go and look. No? But I'm also very excited that we are going to have a lecture, and I think it's again very appropriate that Dr. Rachel Reyes is going to talk about um, intimacy and relate that to history. I don't know, I, I feel, Rachel, that sometimes your book is not well enough publicized. No? And in fact, I had to rush into my room to look for it, and I couldn't find it, and I have a feeling someone stole it again, which is what happens to my best books. <laughs> but it was published later, Rachel, if you could if you could uh, mention, I believe it was reprinted here by Atenea, right? 
yes, it's Ateneo. No? So if you can give more details on how to get it. No? And again, very appropriately, I will be teaching um, a course on exploring gender and sexuality next semester. And I will, I know my book will surface or else I will run over to Ateneo and get it. And so, and I will tell them that I actually heard Rachel talking about it today. No? Uh, I'm very excited also. I'm gratified that we have 160 attendees besides the 11 panelists. No? And I can assure you that we're going to have a very exciting evening here. Uh, I wish I could, I don't want to call out all the people's names that I recognize here. They're actually about five to 10, which is a good thing because it means that all the names that I don't recognize, it means that they're the younger ones, that we are reaching out to the next generation, the ones who will see the centennial of Asian Center. Now, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I might not be around by then because I would have to be 103 years old. No? But mga iba dito, you will be around. And I, I hope you will tell them about that great day on November 25, 2020, when we welcomed Peter, Professor Peter Baumgard's books to the Asian Center. Raming salamat. Let me not take up time from the other very exciting presentations this afternoon. Good evening to all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tan, for your very encouraging words. Um, we look forward to seeing you in person at the Asian Center anytime soon. Okay, and to share with us the life works and many contributions of Peter Bungard. It is a great honor to welcome Professor David Henley, currently Professor of Contemporary Indonesia Studies at Leiden University. Please welcome Professor Henley. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm David Henley and it is an enormous pleasure and honor for me to be involved in this uh, launch of the Peter Bungard um, book collection uh, as uh, as somebody who who was a, a, a friend and a close colleague of um, Peter Bomkhad while he was uh, in in his life, uh, I was one of his anak um, buah in Indonesian terms. I uh, his his followers, his uh, his proteges. I'm not quite sure what the Filipino word is. I'm sure Ariel will know. Um, I think uh, Peter would have been very uh, pleased with this event and pleased of this uh, great use to which his uh, book collection has been put. I think it's a fitting way to um, remember him. I've been asked to say a few words about uh, Peter's uh, contribution to, uh, to, the, to the field of Southeast Asian studies. And I've been asked to say it in a few words and to say that, to do that in a few words is not easy. Um, Beta was um, one of the most distinguished um, historians of Southeast Asia in his own generation or in any generation actually and he was also one of the most um, prolific and he lives on in a huge academic uh, legacy of important written works. Three books of his own, 16 collective volumes, more than 120 published articles and chapters and the range of topics on which he published was extraordinarily um, wide and one such field one of his uh, favorite fields was um, historical demography um, in this area he produced the definitive study of the historical demography of 19th century java but he also wrote more broadly on the subjects of uh, fertility birth control disease and medicine, <clears throat> making key contributions to the debate over the causes of low population growth in pre-colonial Southeast Asia and of the subsequent population boom from colonial times onward. Peter also wrote about economic history. In this field, he contributed writings on um, monetization, on credit and debt, business cycles, state welfare services, land tenure, and the economic consequences of bonded labor. His most prominent, single most prominent research role though, was in the field of environmental history, environmental history. It's hardly too much to say that uh, Peter actually single-handedly pioneered 
the study of the environmental history of Indonesia. This was also the origin of my relationship um, and cooperation with uh, Peter because it was in the Eden project uh, that was Ecology, Demography and Economy of Nusantara, which was essentially an environmental history project, uh, that I came to work at the, the Kaitel Bay, the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies here in Leiden. Uh, <coughs> and that was a, a project established by Peter and run under Peter's uh, leadership and I was um, one of the researchers that were involved in it for several years, many years, <clears throat> in fact. Um, Peter contributed to pioneering this field of the environmental history of Indonesia through the Eden Project and through many other endeavors in the organizational and fundraising sphere, but above all, through his own research and the example which it set. His publications in environmental history included two major monographs, First of all, the only book to date on the historical relationship between tigers and people, uh, Frontiers of Fear, Tigers and People in the Malay World, 1600 to 1950, which he published in 2001. <clears throat> he also published the only comprehensive textbook to date on the environmental history of the Southeast Asian region as a whole, that was Southeast Asia and Environmental History, 2007. At the time of his death, he was also working on a further book dealing with forests and forestry in Java from 1500 to 1950. Among his many articles and chapters on environmental history topics, particularly widely cited have been those articles and chapters which explore the histories of uh, forestry, of nature conservation, and of non-rice food crops in Indonesia. Peter was a, a richly empirical scholar. He had a traditional sense of thoroughness and attention to detail. His publications are mines of well-ordered information. Yet, Peter also possessed the ability not to miss the wood for the trees, an ability which is uh, um, the mark of the true scholar. <clears throat> he could distinguish between an important and a less important fact. Many of his research findings were unexpected and trailblazing. He was, for instance, among the first researchers to emphasize the importance of low reproductive fertility, low birth rates, alongside high mortality, high death rates, <coughs> to the low population growth rates of pre-colonial Indonesia and pre-colonial Southeast Asia. He showed how traditional methods of fertility control, including contraception and abortion, kept birth rates low and how traditional social institutions such as bride wealth and slavery created incentives for Southeast Asian women to reduce, to restrict their fertility using those techniques. In another counterintuitive insight, he demonstrated that Java, and this is a finding which has subsequently been extended to other parts of Southeast Asia, in the 19th century under colonial rule, de-urbanized with the proportion of its population living in towns and cities falling rather than rising in the course of the 19th century. Whereas um, up until he published his book on the historical demography of Java in 1989, the reverse had usually been assumed. In Frontiers of Fear, his tiger book, he highlighted the intriguing fact that tigers in Southeast Asia were not creatures of the natural forest, but thrived where human action created open landscapes rich in large prey animals like deer and pigs. This meant that tigers were effectively symbiotic with people and that for a long time the numbers of tigers rose rather than declined as human populations grew. So these were some of Peter's um, surprising and counterintuitive insights, just a few of them, which he was able to extract from the wealth of data which he organized and um, presented. Perhaps because of his early schooling in natural science, Peter had no fear of statistics and he often used quantitative data and methods in his work, especially in demography. But it is certainly not true to say that he dealt only in statistical abstractions. In fact, he was rather exemplary in his concern to integrate such things as ethnography, folklore, and 
anthropological insights into his historiography, even when he was dealing with population uh, growth. Uh, <clears throat> this was particularly apparent in his early work on fertility patterns and birth control in Java, and it reached an, a new level in Frontiers of Fear, whole chapters of which are devoted to ancestral tigers, weir tigers, and the tiger rituals of the Javanese courts. Toward the end of his life, Pater also um, uh, <clears throat> developed an interest in individual experience and behavior in history, an interest which was strengthened under the influence of, uh, of his wife, uh, Raquel, who of course is one of our speakers uh, today. And Raquel encouraged him to tackle new themes such as uh, sexual diversity and the sensory environment in the last few years of his activity as a scholar. So he was very diverse. He remained perhaps above all a scholar with an eye for the big picture. He was deeply inspired by the work of the great French historian <coughs> Fernand Braudel, who made the concept of the long durée common currency among historians everywhere. Peter was an enormous enthusiast for long historical time frames, resulting in impressive but sometimes faintly amusing Baumgart articles article titles like, for instance, Economic Growth in Indonesia, 500 to 1990, classic Baumgart title. It was not for nothing that the theme of the conference which was held to mark Peter's uh, retirement in 2011 was Southeast Asia, the long durée, and that the Festschrift published as a result of that conference, uh, which is available online um, uh, as, a as a free access publication, open access publication, is entitled Environment, Trade and Society in Southeast Asia, a long durée perspective. <clears throat> the other crucial aspect of Peter's um, panoptic, panoramic perspective on Southeast Asian history was his ability to make informed connections and comparisons with, develops, with developments elsewhere in the world. He had begun his research career not in Southeast Asia, but in Mexico, only later swi switching his attention to Indonesia in a move with, which left him with a better feel for international comparisons and universal principles than many Southeast Asia specialists possess. In the concluding chapter of his uh, environmental history of Indonesia from 2007, he relates the region's current ecological problems less to, not so much to geographically and culturally specific factors uh, as to Southeast Asia's persistent status as part of the exploited uh, periphery or semi-periphery of the global economy as defined in the Wallerstein model. So he was a, a universalist and a comparativist as well as a Southeast Asianist. <clears throat> Peter is, um, is sadly missed. Despite his untimely death, his influence on the scholarly world will continue to be strong for a long time to come. And of course, the existence of this legacy of his book collection um, in, uh, now in your uh, university will, uh, will be part of that, um, that influence <clears throat> on the scholarly world. He was a, a pioneer, a pathfinder, who mapped out new fields and lines of historical inquiry. Just as important, he, he demonstrated by example how much can be achieved by pursuing those lines of inquiry, inquiry even using labyrinthine colonial archive materials which are not designed or structured for that purpose and which are difficult, difficult to use for that purpose. To do this well requires a sharp intellect, an open mind, a formidable work ethic, and a familiarity with diverse fields of knowledge. But those are the challenges facing historians of uh, Southeast Asia, and Peter proved that it is humanly possible to meet them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Henley, for sharing with us the many interesting contributions of Dr. Bungard to the Southeast Asian Studies Scholarship. And now, to give us a glimpse of this precious collection at the Asian Center, please watch this presentation prepared by Micah of the library section.
Thank you very much, uh, Maika. You must be very excited to see this collection in person. Should our ha current health crisis be resolved, hopefully sooner, rest assured that the Asian Center will be very happy to guide you look over this collection. And perhaps many of you wonder, how has this collection found its way to the doors of UP Diliman? What consists of this collection? Dr. Lopez will be very happy to tell us all. And please welcome Dr. Arya Lopez, Assistant Professor of the Asian Center. Yes, um, magandang hapon. Thank you very much, Dr. Palumbarit. Um, yes, uh, Danae, can you uh, share screen? The, can you share the PowerPoint, please? Yes. Um, so the goal of my presentation is, um, is twofold. First is to reflect on how the works of um, Peter Bobhard enriched my understanding of Southeast Asian history. And second is to think about how the materials in the Bobhard collection can be utilized alongside increasing the available source materials online. Next, please. So my introduction to Peter Bobhard's writings is through an article entitled Early Globalization, Cowries as Currency, 600 BCE to 1900, where he wrote, and I quote, a Chinese source dating from the Song Dynasty presents some sur surprising evidence that Thailand, in addition to cowries from the Maldive Islands, also received cowries from another region, namely the Sulu Archipelago, now part of the Philippines. Next, please. Next, please. Yes, um, he writes further, a source dating from the late 17th century confirms that, that that country, Thailand, was receiving cowries from the Philippines, which pro probably refers again to the Sulu archipelago. Cyanulus was still being exported from the Philippines to Thailand in the 18th and 19th centuries, which might suggest that the earlier shipments from Sulu Philippines were also being cowries. That this obscure, but I think very interesting information came from Peter Bomhard, a scholar who I initially thought was working exclusively on environmental history which is not my field, is perhaps testament to his broad research interest and his, also to his erudition. Next slide, please. But as, I'm, but as my own research interest shifted away from the Southern Philippines and into what one might call proper Indonesian studies, I found myself once again guided by Bonghard's erudition. I discovered that one could understand the early history of Indonesian Islam, not only from religious studies experts, but also and perhaps even more from socioeconomic scholars like Bomhard. In the article following debt, credit, and debt in Southeast Asian legal theory and practice, 1400 to 1800, he reminds us that interest rates from credit in pre Islamic Southeast Asia was between a whopping 30 to 150 percent. However, the adoption of Islam helped lower these rates in the long term following anti usury or riba rules. Bonghard writes, in pre-Islamic Southeast Asian law codes, lower legal rates gravitated around the 30% mark. The higher rates lay between 100 to 150%. Um, with the arrival of Islamic law, there was presumably a tendency in the direction of lower interest rates, although not prior to 1800. The result over a long period must have been some reduction in the prevalence of debt and debt bondage in the areas where Islam held sway. To me, this was an important insight as I examined the reasons of conversion to Islam in Sulawesi, which eventually became my dissertation. Next slide, please. One article I particularly find helpful in rereading Southeast Asian history and which I ask my own students to reflect on is Peter Bonghard's labor land and capital markets in early Southeast Asia from the 15th to the 19th century. It is, like many of Bobhart's works, a scholarly tour de force. He presents evidence on the absence of factor markets or markets for land, labor, and capital in much of Southeast Asia until the 19th century. To me, it is an exemplary way of writing Southeast Asian history, not from the traditional political history, 
but from a long durée comparative socio-economic viewpoint that draws evidence from various Southeast Asian countries. He argues, among other things, that contrary to the widespread view, colonial powers in Southeast Asia encouraged communal land holdings, at least at certain points. And I quote, there are also indications that colonial powers during certain stages of their presence in Southeast Asia were in favor of communal land holdings. The Spanish crown, for instance, gave land grants to Philippine villages in the late 16th century and early in the late up to the early 17th century, thus creating communal holdings out of the royal domain. Next slide, please. But even during part of the 19th century, Peter Bonpart continues, the Dutch colonial state actively encouraged the growth of communal land holdings in Java as it was convenient for the sugar industry and for other aspects of the cultivation system. Bonhart's social scientific approach, backed by solid data, eschews from rigid ideological meta-narratives and rejects convenient dichotomies. For instance, the trope of the oppressive colonial state vis-a-vis -vis the benevolent post-colonial nation state. Next slide, please. But how was Bonhart able to write such path-breaking books and articles including Southeast Asia and environmental history, children of the colonial state, population growth and economic development in Java, frontiers of fear, tigers, and people in the Malay world, among others. Next slide, please. Well, the University of the Philippines is fortunate to receive the building blocks for such books with the inclusion of handwritten card reference catalogs, such as these in the, collection, in the donation. The, coll the collection also includes research notes from the archives in the Netherlands and Indonesia. Uh, next slide, please. We are also lucky to receive such collector's items as the multi-volume Cascadines for Netherlands India, History of the Dutch East Indies, and the Encyclopedia for Netherlands India, Encyclopedia of the Dutch East Indies, making the Asian Center, I believe, as one of the few li libraries in Southeast Asia to have such copies. The Encyclopedia in particular remains an important reference for the history of Indonesia before ind independence and as far as I know, not yet available in digital form. I remember being advised by Leonard Lusset, professor of, of European Expansion and Globalization at Leiden University, uh, to consult this encyclopedia before venturing into any archives. Next slide, please. It is also important to mention that the collection includes notable works by Indonesians, including Sartono Cartudijo's classic, The Peasant's Revolt in Banten in 1888, Sri Margono's Java's Last Frontier, Struggle for Hegemony for Balambangan, and Ige de Parimata's Perdagangan dan Politik di Nusa Tenggara, or Trade and Politics in Nusa Tenggara, among others. Next slide, please. Uh, one apparent issue on access to the collection is language. Many are written in Dutch and some in Bahasa Indonesia. While language is a hurdle, it is not insurmountable. One might even argue that the Filipinos are in the best position to engage in comparative studies on Indonesia because of the closeness of languages already spoken. One should be reminded that Dutch is part of the West Germanic branch of language, just like the widely spoken English, and Bahasa Indonesia is a, Malay, a Malayo-Polynesian language, just like Filipino. One could also say that it is more convenient to access the archives for early modern Indonesia than the archives on early colonial Philippines. The documents that Bompart consulted and which are handed to us in the card catalogs are called primarily from just two archives, the National Archives in The Hague, and the National Archives in Jakarta. The Dutch documents on Indonesia are concentrated in fewer repositories than the Spanish documents on the Philippines. Major collections in early colonial Philippines are scattered in Manila, Mexico, and in various cities in Spain, Seville, Madrid, Valladolid, among others. Of course, the difference lies in the nature of the Spanish and Dutch colonial enterprise in Asia. The Dutch archives, like the institutions that created them, are more coherent and monolithic than the Spanish ones, um, which were produced not only by the state, but also by various religious orders. Next slide, please. The explosion of free historical resources online may reinvigorate research in early Southeast Asia. These previously inaccessible resources are particularly welcome in a region where there is great demand for history, yet little, little knowledge production. 
probably because of prohibitive research costs. The archives of the Dutch East India Company, certainly more than the Spanish archives, are accessible and downloadable online. Even the, even the archives, early modern archives in Jakarta are downloadable thanks to the project called Sejarah Nusantara. Um, advances in computer technology um, promises assistance to researchers um, to expedite the reading of these of this often illegible archives. One example is the handwritten text re recognition program called Transcribus. And indeed, indeed it would be interesting to run um, Bonecard's notes in the software to identify new data patterns or revisit his voluminous notes um, to ask you questions. So I would like to end um, this short presentation um, by saying that there is perhaps no better time to dive into these online resources than nowadays when many of us are locked up at home. Um, on that note, uh, I, would like to say, I would like to say thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lopez. And now let's proceed to the second part of this event. Please welcome again, everyone, Dr. Lopez, to introduce, to formally introduce to us our guest speaker for today. Yes, um, it is uh, my great honor to introduce uh, Dr. Raquel or Rachel Reyes. She is an academic historian uh, and Philippine current affairs commentator. She obtained um, her PhD in Southeast Asian history from the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS in the University of London, and was a British Academy postdoctoral fellow. She is the author of Love, Passion and Patriotism, Sexuality and the Philippine Propaganda Movement in Europe, 1882 to, 19, to 1892, and editor of Art, Trade and Cultural Mediation in Asia, 1500 to 1950. Also co-editor of Sexual Diversity in Asia, circa 600 BCE to 1950. And also author of numerous journal articles on gender and sexuality, history of science, medicine and technology, and early modern global trade and local cultures in Southeast Asia. Her latest work, Sex in Manila in the late 19th and early 20th centuries will appear next year in the Cambridge World History of Sexualities. Um, it is an honor for the Asian Center to have Dr. Reyes um, this afternoon. The floor is yours. Hello, um, good afternoon um, to everybody. I'm, um, I'm very, very happy to be at the Asian Center again, albeit virtually, and to see some old and good friends, um, again, virtually, sadly. Um, the presentations um, today um, were, uh, could not have been possible um, without, um, firstly, Dr. Ariel Lopez, who, um, who, who, who's, who's whose presence in Leiden I eagerly followed as he progressed um, um, through his PhD. Um, I'm, I'm very glad that uh, he was um, able to uh, persuade me to <laughs> donate this collection to the Asian Center. Um, I, know, I know that um, Peter would, be, um, would have been very pleased um, to have his collection in Southeast Asia and uh, that, uh, that students um, in Southeast Asia um, would, would make use of it. Um, I thank also uh, Chancellor Tan for accommodating the collection and um, giving it a, um, such an amazing home and to Dean Santarita for making it all happen. Um, so, I'm, I, I want to confess that I'm here with um, feelings of both sadness because um, um, Peter is not with us. He would have loved to have participated in this. Um, and uh, hope, I'm, I'm here with great hope that uh, the books 
um, will be used and his works will continue to um, inform and excite um, students in Southeast Asia and beyond. So um, again, thank you for inviting me. Um, my paper, I have to apologize in advance. It, it's a bit of um, a sort of um, haphazard approach, um, um, but I hope that uh, uh, we can make some sense of it. <laughs> um, okay, let's, let's start with the first slide, please. Um, finding intimacy in Asian history, notes on pain and pleasure. Um, the first page, please, the first slide. Population growth in Southeast Asia, tracked over several hundreds of years, was a line of inquiry that fairly obsessed Peter. Just to take one example, in his essay, Bride Wealth and Birth Control, 1500 to 1950, published in 2003, Peter wondered why Indonesian women did not give birth to many children. The few established explanations, lack of food, constant low-level warfare, slavery, all seem perfectly reasonable, but he was not wholly convinced of them. Before the modern age, Indonesian societies were sparsely populated and he didn't think high death rates told the whole story. On the other hand, he had a strong hunch that high fertility rates were not a traditional feature of Indonesian societies, but a modern phenomenon. It seemed to him that Indonesian women had been keeping a check on their reproductive capacity for a very long time. For him, the question was why and how. Rachel, um, hello. Yes. Can I yes. rudely interrupt you? There's a, um, a, um, a noise, maybe it's hot. Well, um, um, there's a um, friction somewhere. Um, yes, if, if when you're not moving, it, you don't have noise, but when you, Maybe you're touching the, the speaker. Ah, perhaps. Okay. Yep. Okay. Now, now it's perfect. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> right. Please rudely interrupt. Oh. <laughs> um, so before we look at how Peter grappled with this problem and found his answer, let us digress briefly and travel across time and cultures. We will touch on sex practices, birth and contraception, to search out the ways intimacy and eroticism have helped historians understand the nature of Asian societies. Um, next slide, please. So let's dive into the Kama Sutra, which uh, Dean Santarita was kind enough to uh, mention right at the beginning. Um, I shall defer, of course, to his expertise on this text. Um, and I will simply show you some very interesting slides. Um, the Kama Sutra is, of course, arguably the world's most famous treatise on, on erotic love and was composed in the third century CE. And it is far more than a book on sexual intercourse and somewhat improbable sexual positions. The Kama Sutra reveals a stunningly sophisticated and cosmopolitan ancient world of power and materialism. Wendy Doniger, the internationally renowned scholar of classical Sanskrit literature, has shown us how the Kama Sutra is one of the main sources for data on social conditions, gender, sexuality, wealth, power relations, and politics of the time. She writes, the world of the Kama Sutra is a world of privilege. The lovers must be rich. Much of the Kama Sutra is about culture, which belonged to those who had leisure and means, time and money, none of which was in short supply for the text's primary intended audience, an urban and urbane elite consisting of princes, high state officials, and wealthy merchants. And in this, in this image, you can see the, the, the paraphernalia and in fact, the regalia of the lovers, which, which depict them as, as, as both wealthy and leisurely um, and comfortable. Um, the next slide, please.
in I, I particularly liked um, this um, this passage um, to do with the art of the art of um, um, living, um, where the Kama Sutra um, guides um, what lovers should do after lovemaking. Together, they eat cakes, um, sweetmeats, sip broths and gruel soup. The two lovers often go up to the house where they enjoy um, where they enjoy the moonlight as they chat pleasantly together. Then as the woman reclines on his knees, her face towards the moon, the lover points out to her the various planets, the morning star, the polar star, and the constellations. Next slide, please. Shunga, from 1700 to 1820, paintings and woodblock prints depicting lovers with exaggerated genitalia explicitly engaged in sexual intercourse became popular in Edo, Japan. Known as Shunga Spring Pictures, these erotic images, argues Tim Screech in his book Sex in the Floating World, could reasonably be called pornography. Based on textual and pictorial evidence, Shunga was meant for solitary use, that is, they served primarily as aids to masturbation. These images spun utopic, sexual fantasy worlds, to be sure, but what they can tell us about gender, sexuality, power, and pleasure is necessarily tied to the specific set of conditions, the urban, social, and libidinous economies found in the cities of Edo and Osaka from which they emerged. Sexual thrill, writes Tim Screech, is one of the most basic animal of sensations, but it is culturally encoded and not static. Reading Edo erotica in the same way it was read at the time is a problematic undertaking, and we can never be quite sure we feel what earlier viewers would have felt. Um, in, this, in this image, a woman is shown um, lying entwined with her lover while she is writing a letter. The sliding doors are decorated with cranes, symbolizing longevity. Next slide, please. Here in this um, wonderful picture of um, marital bliss, that you, you can see that the man pleasures his lady with his hand, her feet and toes curl, denoting enjoyment. Um, there are um, uh, tissues that lying on the futon um, and a, a lacquer box filled with um, an ashtray, a pipe and tobacco. Um, and the folding screen at the back is decorated with two swimming mandarin ducks, which symbolize conjugal love and faith, faithfulness and a wish for the newlyweds to live a prosperous and long lasting marriage. Next slide, please. To Southeast Asia and travelers' tales. Next slide. The early narratives and chronicles were replete with detailed descriptions of a variety of sexual relationships, behavior and practices socially sanctioned in native society. Inclined to view native sexual life as mortal sins and perversions, and certainly aberrant, the chronicle, chroniclers, and in the Philippines there were Spanish missionary priests and assortment of European travelers, reported witnessing fornication, adultery, concubinage, incest, forms of polygamy and polyandry. Sex to the pre-colonial natives, in other words, had little to do with the propagation of the species and rather more with the pursuit of carnal pleasure. Um, many I think in the audience will be familiar with these images. They're from the box codex and they show um, um, Filipinos at the time of the Spanish contact. Early missionaries um, noted how Asog and Bayogin in lowland Luzon and the Visayas lived like women, cross-dressing, anatomically male, transgendered or third sex gender individuals could legitimately have sex with heterosexual men because of their fem femininity. Indeed, it was not unknown for them to enter into marital relationships with heterosexual men. Yet, although historically entrenched within the cultures of island Southeast Asia, the status transgendered identities were accorded was never stable. 
Within Makassaris and Bugis courts, transvestite Bisu were ritual specialists, royal advisors and keepers of royal regalia. During the mid 17th century, their position became fragile and some seeking to appear more respectable abstained completely from sodomy and became celibate. Next slide, please. Predictably, women served as the locus of Spanish anxieties over the sexual proclivities of the native inhabitants. Miguel de Loarca, a member of Miguel de Legaspi's expedition, made the typical observation in his 1582 Relacion. The women are beautiful but unchaste. They do not hesitate to commit adultery because they receive no punishment for it. They are extremely lewd and they even encourage their own daughters to a life of unchastity. In his Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas, 1609, Antonio de Morga was scandalized by the observation that future husbands considered virgin brides to be such an inconvenience and virginity a disturbance and impediment that there were men who were paid to end the virginity of young women before their marriage. But far more shocking was the custom of men, especially the tattooed people of the Visayas, to pierce their penises. Credit for the invention and the demand for this practice was quite clear to Morga. Unequivocally, he held women and their unrelenting sexual lustfulness responsible. So he writes, the natives of the islands of the painted ones, especially the women, are much given to viciousness and sensuality, and their malevolence have led them to invent lewd ways for men and women to get together intimately. Next slide, please. The surgically implanted penile insertions in Southeast Asia range from bells usually made of metal, purportedly up to the size of a small chicken egg, sometimes containing a grain of sand, which was said to produce a pleasant tinkling sound. Balls, smaller than bells, were made of stones or jewels. There were also inserts of irregular or unusual shapes, such as the pyramidal forms used by the Batak of Sumatra. Bells and balls were usually found in Pegu and elsewhere in Burma, Thailand, and the Malaccan Peninsula. Bells and rolls in the Moluccas. The Burmese variety, known as Mian Ling, found their way to late Ming period China, where a craze for novel sexual aids provided a ready market. The observant Ma Huan noted the melodious tinkling sound made by a cluster of tiny sand-filled beads that had been inserted into a young man's penis in Siam. But it is in the Philippines, in Mindanao, Panay, Negros, Bohol, Cebu and Leyte and the Bicol region, that a variety of rolls used in combination with rods or pins were common. In the Boxer Codex, um, there is a page where on the left-hand side, we see a sketch of said roll with the, uh, the pin that is inserted um, um, through the miembro uh, viril, the, the, the top part of the penis, and, fix, and fixes the, 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 the spurs um, um, to the head of the penis. Um, the, 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 the deepening interaction with Europeans and conversion to Islam and Christianity, especially among lowlanders during the 16th and 17th centuries, saw the gradual abandonment or modification of many of these practices. Um, the use of penile insertions was eradicated and um, dis disappeared from the records by the mid 17th century. Um, next slide, please. However, um, uh, as, uh, these, these uh, pieces, which are from the Science Museum in London, um, show brass penis pins, which were worn by the, the Dayak in Borneo um, from the uh, late uh, 19th century on. Next slide, please. Female sensuality occupied a key place within court-sponsored indigenous literary traditions known as Kakawin of Java and Bali. In Balinese epic Kakawin, 16th to the 19th centuries, the physical act of sexual intercourse is underpinned by a tantric system of mystical eroticism, philosophy, and spirituality, uniting the human and the divine in orgasm. 
practitioners strive to bring sexual fulfillment to their lovers and incorporated Ars Erotica into yogic practice. Epic Kakawin poetry and religious manuals, Tutor, thrumming with Sanskrit poetics, conveyed an indigenous science of erotics. To reach sexual fulfillment and bring delight to their wives, Kakawin lovers were instructed to employ Smarantantra yoga, the yoga of love or sexuality that was intended to enhance women's enjoyment of lovemaking through dexterous finger work, oral sex, and the use of fragrant unguents. In this way, sexual intercourse was treated as ritual and orgasm represents union with the divine. Um, as Helen Kreis wrote in, in her wonderful book, Women of the Kakawin World, um, the poets, the court poets were, were often religious functionaries and they were known as the soother of cares. Next slide, please. Um, in the Kakawin world, the pleasures of love are to be enjoyed equally by both men and women. In this um, fragment of, um, of an epic Kakawin poem, um, I wanted to share with you um, the, 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 physical, the physical act um, um, uh, joins, joins with the divine. Um, like the deep joy of ivory bamboo when it comes into contact with the rain from the clouds, desire pierced her, filling her to the core as she became one with the prince. It was the same for the prince as he sought release from passion in their sexual union, a devotee of the lovemaking that reached perfection there on the couch. Next slide, please. Female portrait statuary, such as this richly adorned 14th century portrait of the Javanese queen, Ken Dedes, as Prajnamaramita, embodied wisdom, power, and aesthetic beauty. This is a tribute to the founder of the Singhasara dynasty, whose spiritual power was revealed by a brilliant light radiating from her genitals, a signal to her future husband, Ken Ken Angrok of his destiny. Barbara Andaya has argued that it is the condition of being female encompassing the entire life cycle of women from menage to menopause and the female body with its capacity to create, nurture and sustain life and its emission of bodily fluids, particularly breast milk and menstrual blood that preeminently shaped ideas of gender in Southeast Asia far more so than penile erection, penetration, and ejaculation. Female asceticism and celeb celibacy were not rare, but conception, childbearing, and motherhood were the most powerful and repeated tropes. Next slide, please. A host of images underline the anxieties and dangers that accompanied the course of pregnancy. Bar reliefs of pregnant women or laboring to give birth, found in temple complexes of Angkor and Borobudur, bring conception and the difficult experience of childbirth into the realms of Buddhist teaching. Next slide, please. Parturant women and postpartum women were thought to be extremely vulnerable to attack from malevolent forces and thus in need of protection, although usually worn by male and females, could we go to the next slide, um, ascetics abstaining from sex, gold pubic clerks, such as the one shown here, sometimes functioned as amulets to protect postpartum women from evil spirits. That said, the potential risk of an unwanted pregnancy was largely offset by women's readiness to resort to contraception and abortion. Induced abortion was practiced throughout the Malay archipelago to limited social opprobrium. Poems composed probably before 1500, such as the Javanese Kidong Sunda, denounced abortion as sin, but old texts did not hold much sway with the Muslim ulama of the early 20th century, whose attitudes towards induced abortion were remarkably lax. In contrast, official state and religious attitudes were condemnatory. 
Noting its prevalence, the Dutch in Batavia in mid 1600s forbade abortion on pain of death. Spanish missionaries in the Philippines roundly condemned, ab condemned abortion and dealt harshly with those who possessed knowledge of or procured abortive fashions. Islamic theologians in principle permitted the termination of pregnancy up to 120 days after conception, but did not encourage abortion. Buddhist texts delivered a baneful warning to female abortionists, intimating they would be doomed to, re to be reborn as wandering, predatory, putrid smelling, and fly-covered naked ghosts. Although terrifying, such exhortations had limited effect. So let's return to Peter's question. Next slide, please. How did Peter explain low fertility in the Indonesian archipelago from 1500 to 1950? Peter sought out the diaries and eyewitness accounts of travelers, missionaries, and colonial officials who had lived among indigenous communities and who would have gained intimate knowledge of local affairs. These highly subjective narratives declared, with surprising consistency, the infecundity of Indonesian women and their unprolific sexual nature. He settled on a number of influential factors that he thought inhibited women from bearing many children. One of the most important was social custom. In parts of Western and Eastern Indonesia, a bride's family was obliged to present the groom's family with extravagant gifts and services before a marriage could take place. Gold jewelry, elephant tusks, bronze drums, foreign textiles, porcelain, even cannons and guns were the sorts of prestigious gifts a groom's family could demand. This expensive custom, known as giving bride wealth, put off a lot of families who could face financial ruin. Daughters, consequently, delayed the age at which they married. Later marriages led to fewer numbers of children per woman. Hence, in areas where bride wealth was practiced, population growth tended to be low. The second factor was that women themselves took matters into their own hands. According to the sources, women checked their fertility through a variety of means injecting herbal concoctions and potions that caused abortion or miscarriage seemed to have been a mundane, commonplace, and even ancient solution. Women also visited traditional indigenous healers who rendered them temporarily incapable of conceiving by rotating the uterus backwards, a deft massage technique known as retroflexio uteri. Infanticide, the most drastic measure, was far from unknown, especially when twins were expected. Regardless of their marital status, Peter concluded, Indonesian women were well aware of an array of traditional ways and means to limit their offspring, and they were willing to apply such methods when needed. Peter's assertion was essentially this. Despite the considerable risks to their own health and lives, Indonesian women of the past practiced birth control because they wanted to. In conclusion, in the hands of a skilled and empathetic historian, ancient texts elaborate temple stonework, visual images and objects, reveal the variations in the way people of many kinds and at different times took decisions and managed their lives, how men and women behaved towards each other, expressed private emotions, desire, joy and fear, experienced passion, pleasure and pain, and understood their bodies and their destiny. In his book, An Intimate History of Humanity, the Oxford scholar Theodore Zeldin said, only with both eyes open is it possible to see that humans have always needed not just food and shelter, health and education, but also work that is not soul destroying and relationships that do more than keep loneliness out. Humans need to be recognized as persons. The importance Zeldin placed on this point, on the history of persons, is a, is a conviction that, people, that Peter shared. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Reyes, for your very, very interesting lecture. And also, thank you very much for agreeing to donate uh, Dr. Bungard's collections to us at the Asian Center. Okay, um, I, I remind our participants 
If you have questions, please leave your questions here at the Q&A tab here below, okay? Um, we have one question here for you, Dr. Reyes. Uh, it, it says here, can we say that uh, intimacy is a form of empowerment for women in early times? Well, that's an interesting question because um, um, for historians, delving delving into these sources to look for intimacy um, necessarily uncovers women's history. Um, we, we are able to see women's lives through the lens of um, intimacy and eroticism. Um, uh, I'm not entirely sure how intimacy uh, m might have been empowering um, in that way. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the sources tell of um, alliances, marriage alliances that, that, that um, empowered women socially, um, but um, of course intimacy and, and um, can, can also be linked to the, uh, the, the the, the, the use and abuse of women's bodies, um, as in uh, prostitution. So um, I think both stories can be told. Thank you very much, Dr. Reyes. We have another question here for you. May we know the role played by Eastern as well as Western religions on sexuality in Southeast Asia from 1500 to 1900s? That's an absolutely huge question, huge, huge question. Um, um, fluctuations, change, um, um, all impactful, all life-changing. Um, I would suggest that um, the, the questioner um, read uh, um, quite, a, quite a lot of um, amazing books. I would, um, I would uh, immediately uh, um, uh, point out the book by um, Barbara and Dyer, The Flaming Womb, to see how uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Christianity and, and the world's religions um, changed the way um, uh, 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 both men and women interacted with, with one another and uh, their, 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 their social standing in their, in their respective cultures in those periods. It's uh, Okay, um, here's another question for you. Uh, with regards to sexual pursuit, it is now commonly regarded as a simple means for pleasure in modern slash liberal times. How did it progress to such a simple means for pleasure um, from a symbolic and intimate relation and devotion of love slash loyalty? How did it, how did, Love progress? Sorry. I sorry, I can't hear you. I I have no sound. I'm sorry. Uh, the question here is um it is now commonly regarded as a simple means for pleasure in modern or liberal times. Now, how did it progress? To such a simple means for pleasure from a symbolic and intimate relation and devotion of love? And well, firstly, I don't think it is a simple means of pleasure, even today. <laughs> I think, I think the, I think uh, the, the, it, it would be, it would be simplistic and reductive um, to, to, to take, to take that view that, um, that there was a sort of, um, progression or, or, or a reduction of the, the sex act from ancient times to the present where it is simply um, uh, a union of two physical bodies. Um, so I, uh, again, I think it is, it's far more complicated than that. <laughs> right, right. Okay, um, here's another question. How do scarce resources factor in 
into fertility practices of women. Scarce resources factor in, in into fertility practices of women. Scarce resources factor in the fertility practices of women. Um, right, well, right. It, it, it largely depends on what, what culture, what country and what time period um, um, you're talking about. Um, uh, many cultures, of course, have had have had recourse to abortive fashions that um, uh, from that are uh, composed of organic material from plants, um, and um, and as 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 we have seen, um, um, there is a massage technique um, that is used to invert the uterus to temporarily disable. Um, a woman's reproductive capacity. So, um, um, by scarce resources, I would want to, I would want to know what um, the questioner has in mind. Right, right. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Reyes. Uh, I think there's one question here for you, Dr. Lopez. May I ask if the Boomgard collection has materials or documents? on meteorological and geological hazards and disasters in Southeast Asia? Uh, yes, uh, th thank you very much. Um, I have to admit that um, because of restrictions, uh, uh, social distancing and, and quarantine and all, I, I think uh, except for the librarians themselves, no one um, has uh, extensively Maybe looked I'm into the archive, into the, I think Rachel can answer. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, um, there, there is a, there is a uh, quite a lot of material um, uh, uh, related to water um, and fire uh, in uh, in the Bermhardt collection. Um, Peter Peter was uh, very interested in looking at um, the role of water. In societies which included flooding and typhoons and and um, uh, uh, rainwater, um, so in in the Bohmhart collection he has um, he has both handwritten notes um, uh, and uh, um, secondary sources, quite a few secondary sources on on uh, floods and typhoons in Asia. Not not much actually on earthquakes. I have to say, very, very good. Right, right. Okay, um, we have here one question for you again, Dr. Reyes. The question starts with apologies for this ignorant question. Nevertheless, I'll ask this question to you. Um, are the materials associated to birth control practices, plants, ritual materials, also available to people in the lower classes in any of the communities discussed? Or is this practice only available to the higher classes? Well, from from um, my my work on the Philippines, it was available to everybody. <laughs> um, every every woman who needed it, from um, at least as we know from the sources, um, um, had had a, 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 a recourse to um, abort. Um, um, there, there, there were not only were there um, organic materials that were prepared um, for her by specialists, um, but she can she could go to a, 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 a helot, a monkey helot, um, um, to uh, uh, um, uh, to 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 artificially induce miscarriage. Um, and at least I know by the 19th century, with the, with the opening of um, Chinese apothecary shops in Manila, um, um, Chinese merchants would sell abortive fashions to, to, uh, to anyone who asked for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's one question here for you again um, about your book. Okay. Um, the question goes like, I want to know what approaches, methodologies did you use for analysis and what big findings emerge? Um, uh, which book are we talking I'm about? I'm sorry, it's about uh, yeah, the eminent publication in Sex and Manila. 
Ah, right. Well, that is uh, that is still being written, um, but as as I uh, um, uh, I have uh, been looking at um, uh, uh, travel accounts and um, dictionaries, um, and also un uh, um, uh, uh, um, manuals, um, um, courtesy and uh, etiquette manuals. Um, one thing that I have been rather sad about um, is the lack of um, visual materials. Um, unlike um, unlike uh, other, other Asian societies, the Philippines um, during that time, and in spite of um, the boom in print culture, um, didn't manage to um, produce any any um, uh, uh, paintings or drawings of of um, sex sex acts or um, erotica, um, which is itself an interesting question. Why was there a lack of that? Um, right. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's a question here about the terms you mentioned in your lecture um, about the words like bayugin, asog, and the transgender in naming these shamans. Um, another scholar, Brewer, used the term trans trans transvestite male shaman to call them. So um, uh, the participant wants to know your insights on the appropriateness or limits of applying this present day categories on gender and sexuality in historical studies? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm always very careful um, um, using, using terms that are related to this um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, individuals in the past who had or, or who, who, who who identified with um, a gender identity that was not the same as their anatomy. So um, um, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, I, I don't think it um, I don't think it appropriate to use modern day terms such as LGBTQ on um, uh, on on past gendered identities. Um, so. I, I think I think that's a, a fairly anachronistic way of thinking about gender and sexuality in the past. So I I, um, I try I try as much as possible to to understand um, what those terms mean as they have been presented to me in the sources, rather than um, juxtapose modern day terms on historical um, terms. Right, right. Okay, here's another interesting question on pain and pleasure. Um, are pain and pleasure viewed in Asian history as cultural binaries in relation to intimacy or as an interrelated phenomenon? Mm. Well, in... <laughs> Yes, um, I've. Uh, I, I, I'm always. I'm always really struck by the differences in sex practices um, when when we look at um, um, ancient times in Asian cultures and um, um, similar periods in Western Western cultures, where where you see, for instance, um, you know, in in in. in um, images on Greek vases where there is some um, uh, 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 penile penetration of a young of a young of a young boy by an older male um, and uh, um, again you see, well, you see similar things um, in, in, in China and and, and and Japan where, where, where who who is doing the penetrating is uh, is, is is more important than where the organ goes um, um, the, in the, 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 the idea of the idea of pain and pleasure as binaries um, especially 
in relation to sex practices, um, I think has, um, has, has roots in, in, in Western culture, especially from, from around um, the late 18th to the 19th century, when we think of um, the, 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 the works of um, um, Marquis de Sade or, um, 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 well, he's, 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 he's an author that immediately springs to mind when we think of, you know, sadism and, um, um, and the infliction of pain um, um, by, by, uh, by a perpetrator who gets pleasure from seeing pain. Um, and from, from what I, from, from what we can glean, at least from, for instance, the Kakawin poetry that I have, um, I mentioned in my lecture, um, it, it was rather, it was rather more to do with a sort of, um, um, uh, philosophy of erotics, uh, um, a mysticism, um, and a science of erotics where, 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 uh, the, the spiritual dimension was emphasized um, rather than um, um, uh, 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 the, 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 the sort of attainment of um, a physical sensation such as pain. Okay, um, uh, we, we will go to Professor Henley for, um, there's one question here for, for him. How is Peter Bungard as a person? Well, <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, that's complicated. He was a complicated person. He was um, loyal. He was fun. He was interesting. He was intellectually um, great conversation. Um, I always, uh, we had our differences, but uh, um, I always uh, appreciated him both at an intellectual level and at a personal level. I think maybe um, Raquel, although I'm not sure if you would, <laughs> would like to field the question, is, uh, is, um, is, uh, is, is, is a more appropriate um, target uh, for, 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 for that question. My, my, my um, view of Peter is colored by the fact that, 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 that I was his anakua, I was his uh, his protege, I, he was my boss. Uh, we became friends. Um, uh, I've always uh, appreciated him and been indebted to him at all kinds of levels. And of course that colors my, 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 my view of the man. But, it, but for me, he was certainly someone who was, um, who I could without any hesitation and without any uh, shame or any feeling of artificiality that I could respect and that I could be feel indebted to. And um, I learned a lot from him and I owe a lot to him. And I think a lot of people um, do. Uh, when he, when, 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 uh, after his death, there was a, uh, <clears throat> a kind of memorial event for him held in Jogjakarta in um, Indonesia. And um, it was spectacularly well attended. Uh, by young um, Indonesian historians, some of whom who had actually never met him, uh, others who had, and all of, it, all of whom were um, enthusiastic and gen genuinely inspired by him, uh, above all as, uh, as a scholar, but also as a, um, as a, a, as a person in, in, in many cases. So um, he has a very positive um, legacy and you don't get to have a very positive legacy without being essentially a positive person. Um, actually, could I, do you mind if I actually respond to an earlier question, which is one um, to uh, Raquel about the relationship between fertility practices and uh, resources. Um, I, I, I suspect that what the, uh, what the questioner was getting at there was the idea that perhaps low fertility and the practices resulting in it in, um, pre-colonial or traditional Southeast Asia <clears throat> were actually adjustment mechanisms, that they were ecological mechanisms um, which existed at least partly to balance population with 
the economic resources available in the environment, uh, that, the, that it was the, the limited um, possibilities for producing wealth in the Southeast Asian environment, which actually kept the population down and, there, and therefore prevented the population from becoming too poor. And, and we know from early um, European sources that the, uh, the, the uh, 500 years ago, the Southeast Asian population was not regarded as poor by, uh, by European visitors. It was regarded as relatively um, prosperous, but at least by the European standards of the day that contrasted um, with later developments and among the many things which it suggests is a balance of population and environment in that period. Now, <clears throat> um, Peter himself was, um, was uh, uh, cautious on this point, but personally I believe there was a, a lot of, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that this was indeed the case, that uh, fertility restrictions um, regulations, uh, ways of regulating fertility were related to the economic limits, the carrying capacity of the environment. This is most clearly the case in areas which were relatively densely populated and where we find land as an item of bride wealth um, so that you couldn't get married uh, without an exchange of land taking place. And that of course required land to be available and in those areas, uh, agricultural land, we're talking about land to produce crops and, um, and food. Um, and from my own research, I know that there was, that in at least one of the most densely populated areas of Sulawesi, which I um, studied, around, around the early 19th century, the beginning of the 19th century, um, age of marriage was relatively um, late for women, certainly later than it would become in subsequent periods, and we know that bride wealth payments, which are an essential precondition for marriage, did often involve parcels of land. And that suggests very heavily um, people could only marry when land became available to support them. And there, there, there we have a feedback mechanism, which is adjusting the population level through fertility to the availability of um, economic resources, in this case, agricultural land, to support that population. And maintaining a balance. <clears throat> More broadly, we can we can think, um, although again it's circumstantial, that that's true of the whole of the bride wealth system. Uh, bride wealth items, even if they consist of exotic things like elephant trunks and imported Indian textiles, they are usually convertible into more ordinary economic resources like rice or pigs or whatever the or indigenous textiles, whatever. The commodities of the uh, the society in question are, and that means that their availability reflects the wealth of the society, in the broadest sense. And if the society is poor, there will be fewer bride wealth items, um, <clears throat> and therefore it will be more difficult to accumulate the wealth you need to get married. And therefore, people will marry later, or perhaps not at all. And therefore, fertility, the number of children born, will be lower. There's another feedback link between population, density, numbers of population, and the economic resources which the environment and the economy makes available. So um, personally, I would say, um, uh, although the evidence is, uh, it is circumstantial, um, that, that this is true, um, and that in fact, um, economic growth in, in, the long, um, in the long durée of Southeast Asian history, economic growth, not medical changes or um, or changes in culture or warfare, uh, economic growth is in fact the, the driver of population growth. And that one of, the, one, of, one of the most important mechanisms there, if not the most important one, is the, the, the influence of um, uh, uh, economic production on, on fertility. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Professor Henry. We have another question here. Um, you can comment on this too, Dr. Henry. Um, it interests me how before the arrival of organized religion, abortion or other forms of birth control are freely practi practiced and accept accepted. Is this influenced by the Kama Sutra? What does this imply to the gender or sexual views of pre-colonial, pre-organized religion in Southeast Asia? Could this be taken as an evidence that we are 
an egalitarian society before the arrival of Europeans? Uh, is that a question for me? Uh, you can comment on this too. Um, it's a question. Okay, I think in relation to the Kama Sutra, it's obviously more a question for um, Raquel. Uh, of course, only 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 part of India, of uh, of uh, Southeast Asia and uh, is is Indianized to the extent that it would be actually affected in its cultural practices by um, by Indian uh, texts. So, uh, as a generalization, I don't think um, that can be true. Um, the, uh, also, I think we, we shouldn't oversimplify the influence of, um, of the world religions uh, specifically on such things as um, fertility yeah. control. Um, <coughs> Islam, on the whole, um, does not uh, oppose contraception and other forms of fertility control. Um, there's a tendency to, to, to assume that it does. Uh, I, I think I'll pass that question on to, um, to Raquel. Okay, uh, Raquel, what are your thoughts on this? Well, let's see. Um, well, firstly, the, 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 the point regarding the Kama Sutra that is, that is a, a, a great point for the dean to jump in, I think. Um, um, the, the question in Southeast Asia is one that I, I uh, uh, well, most, most, most historians um, would, would, would take a very cautious view in um, claiming or asserting. Um, um, uh, as, as we've seen, um, women were not were, uh, were, uh, were, were, were not um, were not were not uh, uh, um, reluctant to manage the family size um, and turn to uh, and turn to um, abortion in order to keep their size, uh, family size manageable. Um, um, but it, it, again, if I could direct the question at a little bit, sexual diversity, um, where I look at um, um, uh, um, China um, and uh, parts of Indonesia, um, Japan, that, that, uh, that the role of the role of religions had a very um, uneven um, influence on women's, women's practices um, with regards to, with regards to um, their reproductive health and, and, and managing, managing their family size. Um, so any sort of general comment about, about um, whether, whether abortion meant, meant a, a more egalitarian society um, would, be, would be quite Right and banal, um, um, and and I, I would I would certainly shy away from making any sort of generalized sweeping comment that that, that, that abortion was indicative of egalitarianism um, in, in any culture. Really. Okay, thank you, uh, Rachel. Uh, we have here a question for the three speakers. Um, can you please suggest topics for research that can use the Bungard collection for starting scholars? Um, perhaps, uh, Ariel, you can, you can start. You can suggest topics for starting scholars. Um, yes. Um... Yeah, well, I, 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 I don't have any uh, ready answer in mind, but I think it, it could be about, um, um, well, Indonesian environmental history. Um, uh, and I think it's very relevant, relevant for, um, also for the Philippines, um, especially with, you know, um, recent um, environmental disasters. Also to, to, um, to compare Indonesia um, and the Philippines, 
um, environmental um, in terms of yeah in, ter in terms of environment. Uh, maybe D David and, and Rachel also have um, ideas. Is this ideas for um, topics for research. for research? That can use the Bungard collection for starting scholars. All right. Well, I'm, I don't know. Off the top of my head, one thing which is interesting in which people are becoming... Um, um, I've seen a, uh, an interest in it among uh, younger scholars, and it is a, it is a, it is a good topic, is uh, food history and culinary history, the history of uh, Southeast Asian uh, diets and cooking and uh, food uh, cultures and, and, and practices. For me, that's a very fascinating um, topic, just randomly, <laughs> uh, to name something rather randomly. Ra Raquel? Hmm. Well, um, one of one of the one of my favourite sections of the Dome Heart papers is um, Peter's work on um, root crops and um, um, uh, non rice non rice products. Um, so um, he worked on um, he, had, he had a wonderful paper called In the Shadow of Rice, where he looked at um, um, uh, taro and yams, as, um, staples in diets, um, particularly for upland peoples, where rice growing was um, more difficult. Um, maybe um, David can talk a bit more about rice cultivation in upland areas. But um, um, I, I, I always wanted, to, I always wanted him to, I always wanted. Peter to, to, to um, work with me on a on a paper that, that looked at um, um, the, 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 the the cultivation and culinary uses of taro and yam in Southeast Asian societies that, that, uh, that, 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 that sort of gave them the importance that they um, um, had sort of that they had become overshadowed by by rice. So, so yeah, I, I, would, uh, I would I would welcome you to look into that. Um, but also um, a comparison of, on um, um, sex practices um, in, uh, um, between Indonesia and the Philippines, um, and I'm working on a book on sexual knowledge, um, uh, which again P Peter was 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 huge, also hugely interested in in sexually transmitted diseases and how those diseases are being treated. Yeah, he, uh, he was working on syphilis and um, 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 and gonorrhea and uh, uh, um, herpes. Um, and, and we, we would often have discussions about um, how how um, early Southeast Asians um, uh, diagnose STDs um, um, without without the sort of knowledge of, of um, you know the transmission the sexual transmission of pathogens. So um, something within the medical fields, um, I, I, would, I, would, I would usually encourage to, to look at the. the Trove of papers on 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 the, the medical um, interest that that, that 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 Peter was um, really hugely invested in. Um, we both worked on, um, aside from STDs, um, 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 we both we were both really interested in in um, 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 early early colonial early colonial. Um, um, treatments of um, 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 he looked at leprosy, for instance. I know I don't I know there's quite a bit of work now on being done on issues on, on leprosy, but again, nothing of a comparative nature. So um, one one other thing is, is um, one other one other thing that, that, that I think would be great is, is to more on technology. 
the word is this great crazy people um, windmills in Indonesia and 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 how the Dutch um, how the Dutch tried to bring wind technology to Indonesia by 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 building windmills um, that's a single solitary paper that uh, that uh, that he wrote and and, and uh, I think would be great to pick up on um, so in the fields of, of medicine and, um, and scientific medicine, the introduction of Western scientific medicine in Indonesia and a comparison with the Philippines um, is uh, just a few of the exciting ways that um, um, Peter and I would constantly fret and, 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 and ruminate on. Um, um, and finally, one, 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 one question that we were always arguing about was um, 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 why there were no temples in Southeast in, in, in the Philippines. Why, why, why was the Philippines left out in, in terms of the building of these mo of these great monuments? Um, um, Peter and I really wanted to um, to organise a conference and and have a and, and to have papers on on why why is there an absence of of um, great temple complexes in the Philippines um, um, in, in, in comparison to the rest of Southeast Asia. Um, and it brings in all sorts of um, discussions about, about um, 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 the centralization of, 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 of the state and labor and slavery and agricultural practices that I think that, um, that, the, that hasn't yet been done in, in, in Philippine history. There's, 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 there's immense, immense uh, 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 promising topics to explore with this collection. Thank you, Dr. Reyes. You all three have provided very interesting topics for further research for starting scholars. Um, in as much as we want to accommodate all the questions here. I'm afraid we really don't have much time here, but I will not let this question pass. Uh, Professor Henley answered this, and I think Rachel, uh, our participants, me included, would love to hear how is Peter Bumgard as a person? Wasn't that answer already? I'm sorry. Wasn't that answered already? Isn't that awesome already? <laughs> Henry answered it. We would love to hear your thoughts on <laughs> the question. My thoughts. <laughs> um, well, right. Um, you do realize this is a question. A person who is extremely biased in their answer. <laughs> um, um, well, he was. He was a. a um, he was a great, great conversationalist, um, firstly, and uh, that's how we got to know one another. Um, but we, uh, we, we immediately um, um, spoke about um, historical um, matters, and uh, um, he, his, 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 his fund of knowledge and his 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 generosity to share that knowledge will, will, will come out straight away, um, especially to younger scholars. Um, um, he was, uh, if you approached him with a question, he would, he would uh, launch into, um, launch into the, the, that, that question and digress until he would have gotten a, uh, um, uh, far more of an answer that, than you would have expected to get. Um, he was uh, open um, and uh, generous with his, with his time and his, his work, um, and um, and he was also gregarious. He he he, he was uh, loved to cycle fast and long and hard, <laughs> um, and. Uh, yeah, uh, um, he had a great 
a great zest for learning and encouraging um, uh, younger people and a great collaborator. Um, um, collegial um, colleague, friend, um, and uh, um, well, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as somebody with whom I was intimate, um, he was uh, um, a gentle and warm man. Thank you, Dr. Reyes. Sounds like he's a very, very interesting and great person. And on that note, may we request Dr. Uh, Professor Talampas to officially close this event. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, I met Peter when he was alive, but I'm sure I met Rachel one time in her home in Paris when she was still in Paris. Uh, she hosted a nice dinner for us attending the European Southeast Asian Studies Conference at Sorbonne. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for Raquel, for uh, donating the Bombard collection. Now we have a problem where to put all of those uh, index and sort all of them to be used by many of our uh, scholars, both at the Asian Center and elsewhere. Uh, I'm sure our Indonesian friends would also be interested in uh, uh, looking at these collections and maybe of use to, to them too, and maybe our Asian scholars. Uh, uh, on the occasion of the 65th year of the anniversary of the Asian Center, we are really very proud to have you, Professor Henley, uh, Professor Ariel Lopez, who is also a product of uh, the Dutch universities, <laughs> uh, Professor Raquel Reyes, a former scholar, especially at the School of Oriental and uh, Asiatic Studies. And uh, we're very glad we had also uh, former Chancellor Michael Tan. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, the UP Computer Center and the Asian Center team for the technical uh, preparations for this webinar. We hope to have more soon uh we're not yet finished uh in 2020 uh, reaching out to all those who are interested in our topics um, announcements of these events are available on the asian center website thank you and uh, have a pleasant evening as for uh sorry um michelle before you end yes, we need to remind our participants also for the obligatory form. thank you Okay, Dean. Uh, the name? Could you please take our <laughs> picture here? Um, um, I'll yes. Take oh, okay, Janus. Uh, I will count. Okay, one, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Henley, uh, Professor Reyes. Uh, Chancellor Tan, thank you very much for coming. Uh, Ariel, thank you very much. Dean, uh, Sir Talampas, uh, for sure, the Bumgard collection is a gift and a treasure for the Asian Center. And we can't wait, really, to open you know, this collection to the public once health issues, health crisis here is over. And with, on that note, thank you very much. To all our participants, thank you for being with us today. And please don't forget, we have upcoming events here at the Asian Center. Next week, we have the inter-career relations uh, uh, to be uh, uh, conducted here at the uh, Asian Center uh, by Professor Ken Shin of Seoul National University. Thank you very much, uh, and have a great evening to all of us. Ingat po tayong lahat. Thank you to the librarians of the Asian Center, AC Library. Malaking tulong. Salamat po. Thank you. Rachel and uh, David, thank you very much. And of course, Ariel. Michelle, you did a good uh, job. Thank you. Salamat po sa lahat. Thank you very much. I learned a lot, actually. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.